Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brandon. Uh, I'm so glad that you were able to join us this afternoon. We you know, sort of kind of developed this program because of the uncertain times that we're all facing, wanting to really bring together our community um, through the virtual setting, since we really can't uh, be together in person as much as we'd like to right now. Um, as a result of trying to develop this, I'm very excited to announce sort of a newly developed partnership between our office um, and the Pitzer College Art Galleries. Um, we are introducing sort of a summer series, uh, similar to our spring series, of bringing some of our, our artists back to campus, so to speak, virtually. Um, this uh, summer series will include uh, essentially four high caliber discussions over the course of uh, the, the next sort of 60 days, so to speak. Our next session with Kathy Ryan, class of 2006. Uh, each of the four sessions will be facilitated by Kiara Innes, who um, is the curator and director of Pitzer College Art Gallery since 2007. We are incredibly grateful to have her um, and are so thankful and lucky to uh, her, her willingness to partner with our office um, for this very special community engagement opportunity. And with that said, I'd like to introduce you to Kiara. Thank you very much, Brandon, for that lovely introduction and for, introduction and, and for introducing this series of talks. Um, before going ahead, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I'd also like to thank Brandon and the Office of Alumni and Family Engagement for partnering with us. And um, very special thanks to Chris Michno, Exhibitions and Communications Manager at Pitzer College Art Galleries for his help in coordinating and promoting these events. So thank you, Chris. Um, during the summer stay at home series, we're connecting with our talented alumni, working in the arts as artists, curators, filmmakers, or art advisors. Today, we have the great pleasure of hearing from artist Kathleen Ryan, who graduated from Pizza, as Brandon was saying, in 2006 with a BA in Studio Art and Anthropology and went on to do her MFA at UCLA. In just a very short period of time, Kathleen has had enormous success in the art world. She has had solo shows in Los Angeles, New York, Shanghai, Vienna, and London, and has represented by galleries in LA and in New York. Her work is in the collections of the Hammer Museum, LACMA, and the Arsenal Contemporary in Montreal, as well as many others. This year, year she will be in the Liverpool um, Biennial, and I'm not sure whether that's going to be online or not. Perhaps a Kathleen will be able to tell us that. Uh, they're moving um, it next year. Oh, they have. Well, there you go. <laughs> Entirely moved uh, until next year, but we'd love to hear about what you're going to be putting in that work, in that show, if you've already started thinking about it. Today, Kathleen will be discussing her sculptural practice and its evolution since leaving Pizza in 2006. Um, conversation will last about 50 minutes and will be followed by 10 minutes of questions from you. If you'd like to ask something, please send it to me in chat and I will pass it on to Kathleen. Um, in 50 minutes time. Again, you know, we are absolutely thrilled to welcome Kathleen Ryan back to Pizza, and please join me in giving her a huge, huge hand. Uh, thanks everyone. Um, nice to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be considered a distinguished alumni. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Is there, are we all, okay? Okay, cool. Um, all right, um, bear with me. I have a stage fright. I've never done a Zoom lecture, but <laughs> well, let's see how this goes. Um, okay, share the screen. Starting with uh, this one as an icebreaker. This is me and my dear friends in the dorms at Pitzer. Um, all right, <laughs> I'm starting. Uh, I'm starting back at the beginning. Um, this is my. This is my thesis, my senior thesis project that I did um, when I was at Pitzer. Um, this was in the Outback um, before, I don't know how developed it is now, but um, I, I do think the dorms are now 
where this sculpture was. Um, but I, uh, it's, it's called, um, it was supposed to be like a giant pack rat habitat. That's what I called, I called it. it um, I collected branches from the outback and made um, this giant nest that you could, could walk into. This was this, uh, that's like a, the entryway there. And um, you would go into the first chamber and this room was, um, it was, had these little shelves on the walls that were full of like Native American style souvenirs that I collected from roadside gift shops around the Southwest. And then the second room was full of these wax, um, cast wax, pink crystals that I made and there were lights in them and they glowed in and out and it was quite, quite kitschy. Um, I think I made them bubble gum scented. I'm not totally sure why. Um, I, I thought of the whole thing as like a weird roadside attraction meets gift shop meets natural history museum, all of things I was very attracted to at the time, but also found problematic. Um, I think I was trying to maybe make a critique of or a reflection upon like commodification of indigenous cultures and of nature and like the impulse to collect and hoard things, which is an impulse I have, but also have complicated feelings towards. Um, anyway, I haven't, my work's changed a lot since then and um, I haven't really shared this work with anyone for a long time, but since back at Pitzer, I wanted to, you know, share my big thesis project. And um, this is the first time I did something quite so large and ambitious um, and like of a scale I would like later to find that I was very drawn to working in. And it's also the first, one of the first times I used crystals, which ended up coming back into my work like a lot, like over a decade later. So there you go. That is, um, that was how I left Pitzer. Um, this is a photo from the shop where I had my first job. Um, uh, after graduating, I, um, I think I, I think I always wanted to be an artist, but it was kind of a, seemed like a fantasy. Like I didn't know how to actually go about doing that as like a job. I had never really seen a model for that. So, um, so I just set out to get a job in the art world and I ended up working at this um, sculpture fabrication company called Carlson and Company and they made really they fabricated work for like major artists. Um, like this is this is the Jeff Kuhn sculpture that I worked ended up working on for for many years. That so was like a huge huge part of my life. Um, this is a photo of the shop. Um, I just got like an entry level job. That it was really my first real job. It I got like a very entry level job as like an administrator for the shop like I was the shop admin assistant and I made sure everyone's time cards were punched and you know stuff like that um but then um I was out in the shop so I saw what was happening and um I I really learned so much about um how things are made um, and it, it ended up being quite influential. Um, like I also got a peek into like 
the decision making process of some really major artists. Um, the ones that ended up being really important to me are, are Jeff Koons and, and Charles Ray. Um, and I think what's common to both of them that was important to me was like I, they share, uh, there's, I learned about like the importance of the choice of materials. Um, for example, like these are made out of rotationally molded polyethylene, which is what like little tykes toys are made out of, but it was almost impossible to make this sculpture out of that material for about a bunch of technical reasons. Um, but Jeff Koons like insisted on like really pushing the boundaries of what we could do with that material because um, because it's a sculpture of a toy and he wanted to make the sculpture out of the material that these similar toys are made out of, um, not something that looked like it. Like we could have made it out of fiberglass and painted it and it would have looked the same, but it would have felt different and, and been different, which, um, which really resonated with me um, that, the materials themselves carry a lot of meaning and things can look the same but feel very different. Um, this is a Charles Ray sculpture that we made while I was there. Um, it is, it's huge. It looks, it's painted to look like it's plastic but it's actually milled out of solid stainless steel. So like it, weighs many many tons it's um and i think that like the sculpture's called father figure um like even though you can't see the material it's made out of and it would have been much cheaper and easier to make it out of something besides solid stainless steel like the actual the f i i took from all this that like every material has, like it's about gravity. Um, materials have different densities, gravities in physical form and emotionally. Like you can, you can, they feel different. Um, and I think that for myself, like paying careful attention to that and playing with it became like a through line in my work from that point forward. Um, this is an early, this, this is a work from, um, when I went to grad school. So after I worked at that fabrication company for a few years, I then, um, I then worked at, uh, David Kordansky gallery, which was like a young, pretty successful contemporary art gallery. I worked there for a year. Um, and that was the first time I saw how young artists were able to like have careers. Um, like working at Carlson, the artists were so major, it seemed like impossible to like even enter the field. Like how do you get from nobody to like this insane major art star with artworks that are worth millions of dollars? Just made no sense to me, but then once I worked at this gallery, I sort of saw how, just how things can grow um, for young artists. And, and it was really, it was pretty inspiring. I was like, if it kind of gave me the push to, to really, like, I felt like if they could do it, maybe I could do it too. And so I decided to, to really focus on my own work. And I applied to grad school so that I could work on my work full time, which I had never been able to do before because I always had full time jobs. Um, I went to UCLA's MFA program. I was in the, the ceramics department, um, technically. Um, I, I knew I didn't only want to make ceramic work, um, but 
it was the material I'd had the most experience with at that point. I don't have photos of my ceramic work from undergrad. I lost everything, unfortunately. But, uh, but I, I mostly did ceramics when I was, was at Pitzer and, and also in, um, in high school. So it seemed natural to continue that. Um, um, A lot of the work I was making was similar to this. So I was trying to make these gate or kind of fence-like sculptures out of clay. I was, it was making steel structures and then covering them with clay and then firing it all together. Um, just trying to use these steel supports. Um, it's, I was trying to get the clay into forms that sort of defied what you thought clay could do. And um, they would then like start to melt and sag and crack um, in the kiln. Um, I, uh, they were, this one is like, the outlines of like a, a block wall, like a, it's supposed to sort of be like a big cinder block wall, but it, or represent that. And then that is kind of like supposed to be a security gate. Um, these are parts of a scaffold. I was interested in taking these really kind of like things that are these utilitarian, like bear barriers or like support structures and then um by making them out of clay with these really lush like glazes um i was trying to kind of create like attention there um so they're like quite large and imposing um but also pretty fragile and, and broken. Um, then um, this is a sculpture I made. Um, I started working on this series of sculptures at the very um, end of grad school. Um, I, Charles Ray ended up being one of my professors at UCLA. Um, and he would take us to museums and we went to the, the Getty and he was talking, I think he was talking about maybe like a Vito Acconci piece seed bed. And I was, kind of zoning out and looking at this painting that's at the Getty Center. And um, it has this drunken woman and she's holding a bunch of grapes and she's squeezing them. And they're so bulbous and she's so bulbous and her breasts are falling out and everything's swollen with this sexuality dripping out of the grapes and they just have this pressure that I was really drawn to. Maybe Charles Ray was talking about pressure and I was looking at it and all the sex and the pressure, like it's painted on the skin of, of these grapes. Um, like I could just sort of feel it. And I was like, how do I get that feeling of pressure that has to do with sex and that tension on the skin like how do I do that in a sculpture? Um, so I, uh, I stewed on it for a while and uh, ended up coming up with this series. Um, they're called Bacantes um, and they're, they're party balloons cast in solid concrete and they're connected in a cluster by chains. Um, I wanted to use the concrete and the balloons so that there's, so that there's that juxtaposition of the weight and the concrete and the balloon. Um, and there's also the challenge to get 
such a utilitarian material to be sexy and lush. Um, they all have chains cast into them. Um, I was thinking about like the ball and chain metaphor as I was making them. Um, I think of them as figures. They're all titled Bacanti in reference to like the historical depictions of drunken women in, in art. Like this one is, um, this one's actually based off of a sculpture that's in the Musée d'Orsay that where there's like a drunk naked lady like laying over like some studio prop. Um, so um, sort of my interpretation of that. Um, so yeah, I think of these clusters kind of as, as women. Um, so there's this sexiness and this buoyancy, but also there are like literal balls and chains. <laughs> and um, probably a reflection of my own feelings of heaviness uh, at the time. Um, so, oh yeah, there's a detail of um, the chains that are cast into them. So they really just, there's a lot of tension in between the balloons themselves also, because they're really just, I mean, they end up weighing like a thousand, 2000 pounds um, and they're just really like hanging from each other um, pretty tightly on these chains. Um, I'm skipping forward a few years. Um, I was doing those sculptures mostly between 20, 15 and 20, 2017. Um, I got out of school in 2014. Um, the sculpture is from t the beginning of 2017. It's called Between Two Bodies. Um, those are each solid blocks of granite um, and they're ceramic oranges holding, supporting them. Um, I, uh, the blocks of granite weigh about 6,000 pounds each. I found them on eBay. They used to be used, they're like surplus equipment um, from Northrop Grumman, which, you know, manufactures like fighter jets and drones. They're, uh, they're used to like, you mount like precision calibration equipment onto these blocks because they're very stable and the surfaces are perfectly flat um, because of like, just because of the nature of the granite can lend itself to these things, um, I guess. But I, uh, I just found them for sale and they, they, there was a lot in them for me like that they were like this chunk of the earth um that was sort of cut and forced into this perfect um precise geometry um and then used to make fighter jets or something like dark and heavy um sort of a nature industry tension there. Um, anyway, I, I had this idea eventually to flip one on top of the other and use um, these ceramic oranges um, to support them. And uh, I, I chose ceramic and oranges because it uh, it goes back to playing with our like assumptions of the material of clay and it's like fragility, um, incorporating something like fragile and juicy and sexual like fruit felt like a good way to create that tension for me. And I chose oranges because they're so emblematic of Southern California um, as is the aerospace industry 
And so all the materials of the sculpture all came from Southern California. So it, for me, it's kind of referencing the histories of these fading industries there. Um, so yeah, I'm starting to do a lot of fruit now. I don't, I'm not particularly interested in fruit, I didn't think, but it always just seems to be such a good symbol for something like sexual <laughs> or, uh, you know, like lush or like um, alive. So I don't know, I keep using it. Um, At the same time I was making this sculpture, I had the idea to use bowling balls as pearls and string them like a necklace that I draped over the gallery wall. Um, they're all like vintage bowling balls that I collected and they have people's names engraved on them. I, um, I, like they had once been these cherished objects of, of someone's and then that eventually became trash and ended up at the thrift store. And then I thought it was interesting that then I would find them and then sort of by making them into pearls then kind of elevate them again. So there's just like this uh, transformation from treasure to trash to treasure. Um, that's interesting to me. And then again, like a juxtaposition of, of weight, um, like the physical, their true weight in the world, which is very heavy, but then their kind of um, emotional weight of a bowling ball or just like a string of pink, like a pink necklace is quite, quite light. Um, so that was interesting to me. That's another one I made. Um, so I'm making sculptures about jewelry and then I get to these sculptures where I start using actual jewelry materials for the first time, um, like semi-precious stone beads. Um, these are like the seed pods of the queen palm tree. The, the husks are made out of cast iron and then the the beads themselves are um they're rose quartz and i i thought they were like to me those seemed like the most sort of opposite materials in their in their feeling like the iron being very utilitarian and brittle and industrial and the rose quartz having I mean, it's just gorgeous and lush and transparent, but it also has these like, you know, those sort of metaphysical, like love, crystal healing um, associations and also associations with like jewelry. And I, I don't know that, anyway, this is, I basically had to make like a thousand little earrings out of these beads and jewelry hardware. Um, and I, I started getting really interested in in stones um, in this project. Um, there's another one. Then I made this sculpture, which is like the same husks, iron husks, but I, I was collecting these pin beaded fruit. They're vintage. I got them at thrift stores. I honestly found the first ones while I was an undergrad, like out in the thrift stores like south of Claremont um, and I've been carrying it around with me for a long time and then I started finding more and I was seeking them out on eBay and they there were these crafty they were made they were sold as these craft kits in the 50s and 60s and 70s where you like pin your own bedazzle your own beaded fruit and you stick a pin through the bead and pin it into the plastic fruit over and over and over again. And um, it must have been quite a common uh, craft because I have found a lot of these um, really love their kitschy craziness. Um, 
So this is just to show sort of somehow how I ended up making these sculptures, which um, this is kind of a series of work mode that I'm still in right now. Um, I made these about these three about a year and a half ago. These are the first three beaded fruit sculptures I made. Um, they are they're about like 30 inches at the widest point. They're, they're pretty they're pretty big. Um, the they're moldy fruit. Um, pins stuck through beads into like a foam fruit that I've carved. Um, I use the way they kind of depart from the little kitschy vintage fruit I found is that um, like I'm using glass and plastic beads only for the, the fresh parts. And then um, just using natural materials, like predominantly semi-precious stones um, for all the mold. Um, so for me, what's interesting is there's like this association of value that that gets flipped, like using using the wrong things, like using the wrong parts in a way, like like precious, more precious materials for the rotten parts and the plastic parts for the ripe parts. Um, but for me, there's also something significant about the fact that um, these these materials um, are from the earth and they feel like they have a life force or something like they might be like depicting death and decay, but, um, but they feel quite, quite alive. Um, so yeah, that's, um, so I made a few lemons and it, about a year later, I went crazy and made this giant piece, um, sort of like, it's called Pleasures Known. Um, it's like my version of a traditional still life or like Vanitas painting, which is like a rotten, rotten bowl of fruit, but I used a trailer, trailer instead. Um, Um, this is the first time I started incorporating any like object, like found objects with these fruit, like, you know, the trailer, obviously, and then these, um, that stems like an old gardening tool. Um, I guess I don't have a photo, but the, the stems of the cherries are made out of fishing poles. Um, they're, uh, they, to me, sort of like reference like nostalgic American pleasures. And that's kind of what it, what's influenced the title, like pleasure is known, sort of this, sort of maybe fading, symbols and ideals um, of Americana. Um, this is, how am I doing on time? Good, fine, okay, cool. Because um, we've gotten to the present now. Um, this is from a show that just opened um, in February at Francois Gabali Gallery in LA and it was actually shut down early because of the pandemic, but at least I got to, I feel very lucky that I got to open it um, before everything shut down. Um, so yeah, this is, um, well, the series of fruit is called like bad fruit. They're like bad lemons. This is, these are bad grapes. Um, the stems are made out of copper plumbing pipes that I just, I'm like bent pretty haphazardly. I uh, I think they work because they're because they're 
pipes, like there's, and they're, they're hollow, they, they're made for transporting water. So I feel like they, I don't know, I was thinking about like a draining in this piece or like a flow out or like maybe they are sort of, you know, like these are dried, very rotten grapes and um, yeah, something about the, the stems being pipes. Um, having to do with like, like draining and, and outward or inward flow seemed important to me. And I also just really like how sort of basic and normal <laughs> they are um, in comparison to then the grapes and the stones that get, they start to get pretty, pretty insane. Um, at this point I've, gotten assistance helping me um, and we're just beating constantly um, all day long and it's it's getting pretty wild um, and detailed. I'm kind of getting very getting very excessive. Um, so and then this piece this is bad melon which is also part of that show um it's i found an old dilapidated airstream trailer and uh that a tree had fallen on and i chopped it up and used that as um like the skin of this broken um rotten watermelon. Um, I wanted it to be as if it, you had just like kind of dropped a chunk of watermelon on the floor and it like busted open and started, started molding. Um, I, this was the first time I'd really done one of these fruit pieces where, um, the, I was beating like the interior instead of the exterior. So I knew I needed to like I wanted to differentiate between the inside and the outside in some way and that I wanted to do that with a found object and so it took me a while to come to the have the idea of using an airstream um and I don't remember how I came to it but eventually it just kind of clicked and I thought the airstream um I uh the airstream is like the perfect it is perfect shape for a watermelon, but it's also this like, also like a nostalgic symbol of like an idealized American freedom and leisure and pleasure um, that seemed appropriate, especially at the current time um, to show as uh, both broken and rotten. Um, so I, I got, I don't have photos of it here, but I got the Airstream and I hauled it back and I chopped it up and filled it with foam that I carved. And then we spent months also covering it with beads. And there's, yeah, there's these like knickknacky, like, oh yeah, there's the, yeah, I just kind of sawed it up quite roughly and um left a lot of the the airstream details so it's, it's like a weird watermelon um there's a detail of the fleshy part so those are glass beads and then and then the moldy products are again all the like the the semi-precious gemstone beads um and yeah, it's got flies for seeds. And that takes us up to, uh, that's the last major project I did. And um, I don't know how to wrap it up. Why don't you ask me some questions? Well, <laughs> or say something, well, or like an hour over, how long did I? <laughs>
No, no, you're perfect. You're yeah. perfect. We have 20 minutes, uh, 15 to 20 minutes for, for questions. But first of all, you know, I'd like to say thank you so much for going into so much depth about your work and um, for uh, showing the full spectrum of it from uh, leaving Pizza and even some of the work you did at Pizza to present day. It was a really fascinating talk. Thank you. I'm sure everybody would like to give you a huge hand for that. Um, we do actually have a question um, from uh, Kate Hungerford. And, oh, hi Kate. <laughs> and, and Kate would like you to um, speak about uh, the humor in your work and also when that first begun to take shape in your practice? Oh, um, I, I guess it's, I suppose it's, I don't know, do you think they're funny? No, they're a little, uh, <laughs> I guess it's always, there's always something like a little, um, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I think it's always uh, it's, it's always been there a little bit. Um, I I guess I um, make the things that are desirable to me, and I'm desire things that have like. The things that resonate with me the most are things that have, um, that have, like, like if it's too serious, it's hard for me to like engage. Um, so if there's like some level of, like something fun and like attractive, um, and then that pulls me in, and then or seductive, like some beads or I don't know, like that'll sort of pull me in, and then hopefully there's like other layers there too that maybe touch on more serious um, issues that like the, the humor is kind of like, yeah, just sort of a, to draw you in, you know, a layer, one of the layers to sort of make it attractive to me. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we also have a, a question for, uh, from rather uh, Tim Berg, who is professor of ceramics at Pitts College. Tim, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, thanks, Kira. Can you guys hear me? I can. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for your talk. It was really interesting hearing you talk about your choice of materials and especially um, kind of your evolution and understanding weight and gravity and playing with the kind of ontological nature of those materials. Um, one thing I'm really curious about that you didn't really touch on, um, but I think maybe is somewhat parallel to your, the last question about humor is um, a question about beauty and craft in your work because that's something that I see reoccurring and something that I think with a background in ceramics, one learns a specific kind of approach to in some ways. Um, and in, it also seems somewhat kind of like counter to fashion in a way uh, to be thinking about beauty and thinking about really methodical craft. And so I'm just, I'm just curious about your feeling about those, those ideas. Um, it's, I think I'd agree that it was, it was, it seemed, especially seemed counter to fashion like 10 years ago. I feel like people are coming around to beauty and craft pretty, pretty hard these days um, in my in my little world at least but but yeah I, I think it just um, yeah it, it might have to do with the ceramics it I think it also is maybe similar to the my answer to my last question is just 
like I'm very much like driven by like uh desire in my work like I I I want to see things that like are beautiful like and um I have just yeah that's what is maybe has just always been quite attractive to me and I, I guess I'm just always trying to make stuff that's deeply satisfying <laughs> on whatever layer like many levels to to me and then with the hope that it's also um gives that sort of like satisfaction and um to to other people you know and uh i think beauty and craftsmanship is like like humor the good way to to get people to engage before then like getting into some other layers of like meaning or whatever you're trying to go for that might be like you know a little heavier um if, if they're all there they kind of coexisting it it's, it's kind of what i go for yeah uh, thank you. We also have a question from Julia White, who uh, joined us two weeks ago. And uh, Julia is asking a question about the, the particular slide that you have up right now and asks how many pieces are in the watermelon? And did you research moldy watermelon for source as uh, source material? I did, yeah. I well, how many pe like how many beads? Like I don't even know. Like a lemon probably has like there's probably hundreds of thousands of beads. Um, yeah, yeah. I was sorry to pipe in. I was they're they're, they're just incredible your pieces. But um, I was just wondering, you know, because it's all the separate pieces of the airstream. I was wondering like how many uh, separate elements there are and and um, yeah, just a little, just trying to visualize it. Thanks. Well, maybe I can go back to like the install shots. Let's see. There's, so th there's seven, one, two, three, four, five. I think there's six. There's six in this shell. Um, total, there's, um, yeah, there was like these five in this room and then that slicey one kind of like the smile shaped one is kind of alone in this other room through that door um and it wasn't the whole air you know like i probably only ended up using like a quarter of the or a third of the airstream to make this um so i still have some more chunks so i'm still I'm, there might be more watermelon chunks um coming in the future um potentially um i still yeah and wait was there another part of the question um okay yeah yeah just how you research did you did you like source out did you watch watermelon molding to get some of the your inspiration in there yeah I, well we were doing this um like over the winter in New York and actually couldn't find watermelons in the store to like actually break and watch rot. But I was able to find, that was very frustrating, but I was able to find um, photos. Like there's, I found photos online of, I got a whole library, I got a binder. I literally have a binder right here full of, uh, rotten fruit mold photos that like I've collected and taken and stolen from online um, that we reference and all these different things. Um, and, and as far as like the broken shape, it was, um, I did that quite intuitively. Um, I didn't, I really just sort of cut up the airstream 
into shapes I thought would be interesting and then like added, um, you know, foam and sculpted that as like the base and just kind of kept <clears throat> adding and subtracting like you sculpt traditionally um, till I got the shape that felt interesting and then just sort of started going with the beads. So we also have a, a question from Frank Ayala. Would you like to ask that question, Frank? I'm happy to ask it for you. Um, so are contrasting materials an underlying fundamental concern in your work? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yes. <laughs> pick a sculpture and like elaborate it it takes different it takes different forms um um sometimes but yeah i guess i could probably say that about almost everything i've, I've made recently yeah um so I, I have a question for you, uh, Kathleen. So what impact did it have on you, your work and your psyche working in uh, Jeff Koons, a Jeff Koons production factory? And also, you know, in Kodansky, Kodansky Gallery, you know, looking, I mean, very much, you know, from the perspective of this sort of high end art world. And this was really before, you know, you had, you know, gone on to UCLA and so on. It must have been a very interesting experience, but I wonder, did it, I mean, how did it impact, did it impact you in any way negatively or was it all positive? Oh, it was very negative also, yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, it was very stressful. Um, the job at the fabrication place was like, there was like a hundred men, they didn't make just Jeff Kuhn sculptures, but it was predominantly filled with Jeff Kuhn sculptures that were all, many years and millions of dollars over budget and there was like so everyone was just stressed out and miserable and there were like a hundred men working there and like six women and i was like 21 and it's like my first job and i don't know it really it definitely toughened me up um and i also like um, by the end of working there, I ended up working there three years. The company like went out of business in the last, the last financial crisis. Um, but like, what was I trying to say? Um, yeah, by the time I left, I, um, it, it took me a while to, sort of, I had to really force myself to break away from like the obsessive, like perfectionism um, that, that work, that was required of like almost every project we did there, just sort of like the, the attitude of like planning every, like, like when you're, you're working on work like that and hiring a fabrication company to do it, everything is very technical and everything has to be very planned out. Um, and there's, there's not a lot of room for like experimentation and like changing your mind and like working intuitively. And like, um, I, was really craving like trying to figure out how to get a little like my like personality into some works or like i think that's why i made those like kind of busted ceramic works right out of school like i was trying to like you know there was some like technical stuff in those but it was also yeah me trying to like just be okay like with things sagging and breaking and like chance and like 
they're just like the clay is just squeezed onto them very loosely. Um, trying to get, I don't know. And and I had to wake up at four in the morning to get there in time because this it started at six in the morning the work day so that was pretty rough to go from like being a Pitzer college student like staying up all night to like having to wake up at four in the morning and go to my really really intense job in like a factory um so i still like whenever i have to wake up before the sun comes up it, i feel like nauseous i think because that's how i felt every morning before i had to go to work so would never wish to have that experience again but i'm very glad i had it it was it was a boot, boot camp, our world boot camp, sculpture boot camp. <laughs> yeah, thank that. I can, I can only imagine. Um, I, have, I have another question for you. Um, as you said, you know, when you first left grad school, I think you said that you started making these sort of, as you said, bashed up, you know, ceramic, broken ceramic work. And then, you know, then you transitioned to these really exquisite luscious you know great forms and then you moved on to um producing these works that uh were all about decay um and i'm wondering what led you to make these works um about decay and, and what does the idea of uh decay represent for you um well a lot of the works um well in the work sort of leading up to the ones about decay i was like this i was starting to do works that were engaging with like like life cycles like like those palm the seed pod sculptures were like um Wait, where are they? You know, like these are, I don't know, like it's like new life, like bursting through. I, I, I don't know, like, uh, and then these, uh, I don't know, fruit just, I, I just found myself working with fruit, which just, uh, you know, has so much to do with like life and death and like. Like these, um, I think I called this one like, like fountain of, of youth because it's sort of like these symbols of, of uh, like, like mortality, but it's sort of like or like vitality. But then they're just like frozen in plastic, like forever. Um, so maybe that I don't know, like, uh, and uh, so yeah, things, things growing, things um fading as just sort of always sort of there in the back of my mind as like a human um and uh you know and um the i i guess you know i started making these after you know, they have a lot to do with like a lot of work has a lot to do with like decadence and you know which is like um you know like a state of decline brought on by like um ex excess um and it just you know these these last few years have felt quite decadent and dark like the economy's been just i mean before you know oh i made these like two years ago so where we were two years ago it was like the economy was uh booming um and it just felt so um unequal and excessive and decadent like that there was this like inherent like it just felt rotten you know like the next step is like a, a decay so i don't know there 
I think these these works are interesting to me because they 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 have that sort of a for me there's sort of like a reflection of my like anxiety about the time um, and but then but then they're also beautiful there's something hopeful too because they're 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 beautiful like there's there's a there's an energy and like a life force in that decay too um, that I think is hopeful I'm hopeful but you know it's all there um, thank you that, that was a great response and answer. I just wanted to, um, I know we've already reached four o'clock, but I just want to mention there's two other people that want to ask a question for you, if you wouldn't mind staying on for just a couple of minutes. Frank, another question from Frank saying, what inspires you as an artist? And then um, a question from Danny Shane, who also joined us two weeks ago. It's great to see you again, Danny. Um, asking, are the ceramic oranges just made out of ceramics or Oh, sorry, just made out of clay or um, are there other materials involved? And Danny, if I've uh, misrepresented that question, please, please jump in. Um, they are, okay, so they're, the original plan was it would just be solid ceramic. It'd be solid ceramic and they'd be planed perfectly flat. And so there would, I guess the, there are, we ended up having to put some stainless steel rods in there also. So they're, they're ceramic, they're solid. It is bearing most of the weight um, in theory, like it, from what I understand, I was working with an engineer on this, like the, the fired ceramic is actually, you know, quite, strong in uh you know compression because if like the the force of the granite is 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 spread out over like a few inches that are perfectly flat um which it was um so that's what i wanted it to be and it would have worked in like a completely controlled environment where no one would touch it or there weren't earthquakes but um for safety, like if there was an earthquake, like for the like, lateral force, we needed to have like some, some, some rods connecting the blocks um, to keep them from shifting side to side. So yeah, it's, it's ceramic and also some, some pretty thick stainless steel rods inside of the oranges. And, um, and what in, Fires me all sorts of stuff. Um, nature, kitschy Americana from thrift stores, ancient, ancient, beautiful, like, you know, sculptures at the Met, you know, I, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, those are a lot of like my influences or like things I get really, um, yeah, walking around and finding stuff like some, like I just, I like going to, I like going to, I go to thrift stores a lot and like junk stores. I like sort of like absorbing lots of like, just the sort of like junk that culture makes and then waiting for something to pop out at me um, and have an interesting form or like make me think about something. I don't know. Yeah, I sort of just, I like stuff. I like stuff <laughs> and every once in a while, like there'll be something I find that really inspires me that someone threw out and it'll lead to like sculpture like this yeah thank you very much well i think we've yeah we've gone over time um just remains for us all to say you know thank you so much kathleen this has been an absolute pleasure um and a real treat 
to see your work and to hear you talking about it. So thank you again. It's just been wonderful. Thank you. Big clap. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, go Pitzer. Thank you very much.